Hi, Robbie. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Um, I'm very good now that I'm speaking to you. He's one of the all-time greatest athletes you need to know. In the trailer for The Longest Wave, you said, I'm more of a dreamer than a goal setter. Can you explain how this motto has carried you through your life? If you read quotes from successful people, usually their number one thing is goal setting and I've always sort of pondered and gone, well, that's kind of weird because I've never really looked at things that way. It was never a plan. It's not like I set out to say, okay, I'm not going to set goals for myself. I'm just going to uh, see what happens and wing it. It's just the, the honest assessment of how I've sort of meandered my way through life. Um, I guess it's more because of the, uh, the luck that I've had to have the career that I've got. Right, to be doing the kinds of things that I've been lucky enough to get paid to do for a living, where planning and goaling would be pretty tough because a lot of the things that I've been involved with didn't exist until I started being involved with them. And I'm not the kind of guy that you know sits down at my desk and tries to think of the next best thing. And okay, I want to do this, and I want to make 4,000 of these by September. Even in business, I just don't work that way. My brain doesn't work that way. In hindsight, it seems like it would have been scarier and whatnot than it was. I mean, I was a shy kid. Like I was that kid that would cry having to go to school on the first day. And I wouldn't do the Halloween parade from class to class because I was just too embarrassed. There was no way I was going to stand up in front of other kids and go to another class. So I was kind of a weird little kid and was pretty shy. And so it was interesting. I loved doing things on my own, although I played team sports and whatnot as a very little kid. I just enjoyed individual things more. You know, being able to, to go on those trips, going to Berkeley the first time um, for the Nationals and then going to the Bahamas. It had to have been scary because I know I wasn't super comfortable around a lot of other people, but I think I really dug the challenge windsurfing. I really, really loved windsurfing and I loved competition and it just kind of you know, set me on that path of enjoying that kind of pressure as well. You know, being uncomfortable to a certain degree and kind of working through it personally, doing the best I could, even with that kind of, like I'd get into a situation, I'd be around a lot of people, I'd focus on like listening to the skipper's meeting or whatever. I wouldn't look around. I wouldn't like look at other people. I know there was a hundred people around me, but I wouldn't be engaging. I wouldn't be like looking people in the eye. I'd be there, but I'd really be in my own little world, like listening to the race committee and then go off and do my thing. So there, was, there wasn't a huge amount of interaction with other people while I was there. The, the older I get, the more I appreciate how lucky I am to have come from where I came from, when I came from there and how I came from there and how my parents raised me and continue to guide me. But as a kid, yeah, they, they really gave us independence. It was, a, it was a very different time then, you know, there were no cell phones. My parents had no idea where we were when we were little kids. You know, you'd, you'd get home from school and off you went. It was fantastic. And even once my career started, the fact that they let me do that, you know, independently on my own uh, was amazing. You know, traveling alone to the other side of the world as a kid and not just once, you know, it was, it was Bahamas in 76 and Sardinia in 77 and Cancun in 78 and Greece in 79 and back to the Bahamas in 80 and all of those unchaperoned. It certainly helped to give me independence and self-confidence. Uh, but then through my professional career, my parents were there as well. My dad quit teaching high school in 1980 and started making boards full-time. And so through pretty much my entire professional career, my dad was making my boards and I always had the best equipment. You know, I ended up becoming sponsored by a big European brand, but my dad ended up working for them to make all their boards. Especially in windsurfing, the equipment became very, very much a part of 
being competitive in the early days like in the bahamas and all those events world titles through the 70s into the early 80s it was a one design so everybody was racing the same gear so everybody had the same board and the same boom and the same sail and it was really you against the other people and once it turned professional it was open class you you were riding whatever so also unlike a lot of other sports where the athlete is given their equipment by their sponsor. Okay, here's your new stuff, go go ride. Uh, I was always involved with developing it, working with the fin um, guys making fins, working with my dad making boards, and, and Harold Leakey, my, my late shaper that worked with my dad, uh, working with the sail designers to make the sails. And it got to the point, especially in the racing disciplines where your, your equipment was 90% of the equation. You, you could be the best guy in the world and not have the best gear and have a hard time getting in the top 10. And then you'd have guys that weren't all that good with really good gear and they were in the top 10 all the time. So your, your equipment became very, very, very important. And even though I didn't love that aspect of it, luckily I was surrounded by people that were really good at making the gear and that I could translate what I wanted to well enough that I always had competitive equipment, even as the sport evolved and changed amazingly. And that was kind of a challenge because I, I'm the kind of guy that really likes to ride my old gear and just focus on it and get as good as possible and not constantly have to like change my style to ride new gear. But that's what happened because the sport changed so fast. I mean, if you're young these days, there's a lot more information everywhere at your fingertips. There's still going to be mystery. You still know, don't know exactly what you're going to get. But say you're going on holiday, you're going to have a pretty good idea of where you're going, right? Like you're going to have an itinerary the way most people work. They're going to look it up. Oh, but let's go to this museum and let's go eat at this restaurant. And it's like, like you'd have your whole trip planned out yeah. before you even go and you know what it looks like and you know where it is, right? I still want to walk up to a restaurant and read the menu in the window and see if it looks good. But it certainly changed the dynamic compared to the days when you, you had no clue. In some ways it's amazing and there's just so much information available. Everything is available. The best thing people can do these days when they get home from work is like, put their phone in a lockbox and just live their life for at least a few hours a day. I mean, that's what's so good about surfing and windsurfing and kite surfing. You completely unplug, you disconnect from that stuff for a while, you get out of the water and you actually live your life. You think you do lose, I think, a bit of yourself in that. Like I'm watching my 14 year old daughter try and navigate her way through being a teenage girl. It looks really difficult, you know, because so much a part of your life is that constant communication and information. I mean, they're, you're doing your homework on the computer. You just can't get away from it. And I think it's so important to get away from it. You know, the more I encourage her to do that, the harder it is because she feels like she's, you know, gonna get, she's not gonna have any friends if she doesn't answer their texts. And I don't have any notifications on text. I don't have a ringer on my phone. I have no announcements on Instagram or Facebook or anything. You know, I did have a real life without technology because it was pure. The Longest Wave. It's by Joe Berlinger, and he's known to have a specific type of profile for his work. And I was wondering if you would consider yourself to be kind of like in that realm of, you know, people who are very pay attention to detail, a desire to succeed. Like, do you think you were hardwired that way ever since you were little? Like, is that something that you were nurtured into or natured into? No, I think I was certainly born with an odd personality. Um, <laughs> I'm very self-driven. I'm very independent. I think that's helped me through the sports that I have been involved with, with that require a lot of independence. I mean, I was traveling on my own. I was, you know, you don't have a pit crew of guys helping you with all your stuff. You travel halfway around the world with 300 kilos of gear, rent a car, pile it on top of your car, drive five hours to the coast, you know, get all your stuff together. You had to be pretty self-driven. Joe's, you know, different. I watched his films and I, I just imagined the complexity of how he can juggle all of these different things. And, you know, you, how do you have that story in your head? And then you take all the pieces that you film them and weave them into, not so much in the longest wave. I mean, the longest wave was a bit out of his wheelhouse. It still ended up being a pretty 
in-depth, complicated, interesting story for an action sports film. That's what's unique about it. I, I didn't want to make just a normal sports movie, and he really did that. But if you watch some of his other stuff, like how did he even get these interviews? And how did he, how did he, you know, you end up watching a film and it's like, which side am I on? Am I, is he the bad guy or is he the good guy? And just incredible depth of, of editing where my brain's not that good at juggling so many things. It's, it's just incredible. I imagine his office must have millions of those little sticky notes all on the wall like okay and i'm going to take that interview and it goes there and this one goes there and that's going to weave this story that he's that i've got in my head like very very impressive because it's yeah. so different from the way i would be able to approach things i'm sure it was more challenging for joe and in a film making capacity than it was for me because the thing kept tripping over its own feet as I kept injuring myself. And, you know, uh, I think he wasn't expecting this to, to last so long and trying to put it together. You know, when I broke my pelvis, we didn't know if I'd even be able to, to windsurf again or do any of this stuff again. And then, you know, got through that, started to get going again. You know, he had obviously to go off and do other films, had other responsibilities. So his schedule was full. We'd finally get a, an opportunity to get back and get going again and then I broke my foot. And so there was a lot of this on again, off again communication. So he was quite patient um, through the process, which I think was probably pretty challenging for, for a guy that is that busy with other projects. Like he did the, uh, the Ted Bundy series mm -hmm. during the making of The Longest Wave. He did the feature film um, with Zac Efron during the making of The Longest Wave. So uh, there was a lot going on in between and um, you know, for me, it was easy, you know, not easy. I mean, I was going through a really, really hard series of, of things in my life, but on the filmmaking side, it was easier for me. It was a little odd showing up at a surf spot and having a crew of 15, 16, 17 people. It's hard to be stealth, natural, and like under the radar as you pull up to a spot with four cars and cameramen running around. I was like, oh my God, can you guys like wait up the road for 10 minutes? Let us get out, get some, and then one at a time come in. We can't just pull up to a surf spot with this army of people. We're gonna get like kicked out before we even get in the water. So there were challenges in that respect uh, because you know, there's a culture there and you can't just come into a place and overwhelm it, especially when you're not from there. Yeah. So that was a bit challenging at times, so we, we pulled it off. You know, we only have so much time left on this earth. And how has your relationship with time evolved, you know, as you've gotten older? And what would you like to do with the rest of your time? It's it's so funny because everyone I'm sure has older people in their lives when they're younger telling you to, you know, enjoy every moment because time goes fast and you know, that kind of thing. And it's true, the older you get, the faster time seems to go. And I, I think it's because every single day, every minute, every second, every year becomes a smaller percentage of your older overall experience the older you get, right? So it's not easy, especially I think, given the complexity that life, uh, at least for us in the West has, has become through technology and all these things that are supposed to help us with our time to be more efficient and to stay busy and to stay connected it, it really does suck a lot of the, the idle time that i think allows you to really sit back and think and go okay is this who i want to be is this what i want to do and that reflective time that one um, used to have more of is kind of gone or it seems to be at least in short supply now for me now i'm just trying to slow it down as much as I can. And, and I know for me personally, it's probably better than it is for a lot of people because I have a life where I can kind of still, even though I have a lot of balls in there, I can do what I want today. I don't want to go to work. I'm not going to go to work. If I want to go, if I want to go kite, I'll go kite. If I want to go windsurfing, I'll go windsurfing. If I want to fly to Oahu to visit my family, I can do it. So there's no, nobody telling me what I have to do, which I think allows me a little bit more flexibility in managing my time. And I don't know, I, I think if you went back on hundred years, days probably seemed a lot longer and years probably seemed painfully long. If you went back 500 years, uh, 
time probably didn't move at all. And, and now just because we're so busy and there's so much going on, time is really fast. So you got to try to slow it down and enjoy it. What other sports and athletes do you admire? When I was younger, like zero. I didn't follow any other sports. Uh -huh. um, now, a lot. Formula One is the only other sport that I really follow closely. So Formula One motor racing, I love it. MotoGP, uh, same thing. Surfing to a degree, you know, professional surfing. Would you consider yourself an adrenaline junkie? Yeah, but not with reckless abandon, with, uh, with calculation. What has been your greatest victory in life so far? I wouldn't say one single moment or event or thing. Uh, at this point, probably longevity. Hmm. The fact that I've been able to do what I've been doing for as long as I've been doing it is a pretty good victory because I really wanted to do this, um, you know, and then tried to set myself up to have it last another year. Maybe I can make it last another year. Oh, it would be great if I could make it last another year. And I'm 58 and I'm still making it last another year, so. Um, what is one thing you always want your children to know? That I love them to death. What is your favorite song and why? Probably Talk Talk Life's What You Make It from, God, that was from like the 80s. Probably people don't even know who Talk Talk is now. What age do you wish you could permanently be? A tiny bit younger than now because I'm so scared of like getting older right now and slowing down and you know waking up and getting a little sore uh i'd, I'd take right now if i could stay this age you know yeah, yeah. self selfishly you know a year or two younger but every year's experience adds wealth and knowledge and appreciation yeah. i wouldn't want to say 30 or 40 or 50 because i think i'm wiser and smarter to, to live better right now than back then so if it was just the physical age i was choosing and not the mental capacity i'd, I'd go younger if i could have the knowledge and know-how from today in my 30 year old body i'd probably do that but if i had to take the whole thing as a unit right now we ask this question to everyone what does la dolce vita the sweet life mean to you uh, life is amazing life is beautiful life is such an incredible opportunity, such a gift, and it's what you make it, right? I always say, like, so you make it, make it a good one. And you never know how long you, you have here. So, you know, love hard, play hard, work hard. You know, life's not fair sometimes. Uh, and be super optimistic, you know, and, and give yourself as much opportunity for good luck and good health as possible. Like, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs. I'm, I'm not walking around in a in a plastic bubble living my life being protected but I live smart because I want life to be as as rich as possible. Thank you so much, Bobby. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thank Pleasure. You.